A warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 17th of September. Now, in the United States, there's talk of what's called a mass disabling event. Um, now, that might be a bit melodramatic, but there does seem to be an awful lot of long COVID in the United States. So as we get over the acute episode, we're seeing long COVID that's lasting sometimes for three months, sometimes for a year, sometimes for two years. We've got good data from the United Kingdom and we're getting some good data from the United States now. And the rate in the United States is pretty well, well, it's slightly more than twice the rate in the United Kingdom. So what's going on here? Let's look at the data first. Um, now, this is from the um, this, this is the headline from the CDC, nearly one in five American adults who've had COVID still have long COVID. Now, as usual for the CDC, it's a bit hard to decode, but we will get there. More than 40% of adults in the United States having reported COVID in the past. So 40% of adults in the United States have reported having COVID. Now, the real number, of course, is way higher than that. We know that from, from symptomatic data and we know that from antibody data. So this is an underestimate. But of this 40%, 19, 19% uh, are currently still having symptoms of long COVID. So if you're still following the CDC's reasoning, that's 19% of the 14%. Now, this is from uh, the Long COVID Household Pulse Survey. And it is a 20-minute uh, online survey. So, of course, if it's a 20-minute online survey, this means basically it's self-reporting, isn't it? This is people self-reporting. What we need is some diagnostic criteria, really, but we haven't got it. We've only got the data that we have. But there is still other things that make it quite concerning for the states uh, and to some extent for the UK as well. Uh, so for all adults, uh, all adults uh, in, in the United States, um, this is what the data shows. Over, overall, one in 13 adults in the US, that's 7.5%, have long COVID symptoms. This is a remarkably high prevalence, defined as symptoms lasting more than three months. Now, for the UK, I've put the comparison there. In the UK, symptoms lasting more than three months, it's 3.1%. So we see over twice the self-reporting of long COVID in the United States. So why is this? Is it more uh, obesity in the States? Is it more comorbidities in the States? Is it more untreated pathologies in the States? Is it related to factors that we're not really at liberty to discuss? Or, 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 or is it related to other lifestyle factors? What, 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 what is it? We don't really know. Is it the fact that people in or the, the possibility that people in the United States are more likely to report long COVID than in the UK? Don't really see why that should be the case. And before you leave on the comments, we don't have data that compares vaccinated versus unvaccinated people for the level of long COVID. We don't have that data. We simply don't have it. We simply don't know. So, um, but let's go on. So that, that's the, the UK comparison, 3.1%. So over twice. Now, this is the United States data, male, male, may, male versus female. Women, 9.4%, men, 5.5%. Remember, making up that 7.5%. UK comparison is also more common in women, which we know. What about older versus younger comparisons? Well, what we see in the data from the United States is that long COVID is more common in the middle-aged, very similar to the situation in the United Kingdom. Let's just have a look at that data now. So uh, nearly three times more common in the 50 to 59-year-olds than in 80-year-olds and older in the United States. And in the UK comparison, it's also more common in the 35 to the 69 year old so a bit confusing there because they've taken different age brackets but it still shows that it's more common in sort of more middle-aged people as opposed to older people ethnicity from the united states nearly nine percent of hispanic adults currently have long covid non-hispanic white people 7.5 percent black 6.8 and asian adults in the united states 3.7 so we do see a, a sort of a ethnicity difference there now the next bit is a bit strange the united states centers for disease control actually quotes differences for sexual orientation now why sexual orientation should affect long covid i haven't quite worked out yet but um we'll put the data on anyway seeing they've quoted it very strange it's like they're trying to pander to particular groups in the united states i don't quite know why they would 
uh, do that if there's no, if there's a, well, let's see if the scientific uh, credibility first of all. Bisexual adults, twelve percent have current symptoms of long COVID. In the UK, we don't collect this data. Transgender adults, fifteen um, percent. So, <laughs> bisexual adults and um, transgender adults have got higher reporting of long COVID than. Um, what, what, well, other groupings, heterosexual adults. Now, I, I really don't know why this would be. I don't see any biological reason why they should have higher uh, prevalence of long COVID. Perhaps there's an increased tendency to report long COVID. M maybe more on that to come. At the moment, it doesn't make too much sense to me why that should be the case. Differences between states. So uh, Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee, South Dakota lead the pack, um, unfortunately. Kentucky 12.5, Alabama 12.1, Tennessee 11.6, South Dakota 11.6% of the adult population reporting long COVID. This is remarkably high levels in these states. And the states with the lowest numbers, obviously other states are in between, Hawaii 4.5, Maryland 4.7, Virginia 5.1 on the lower one. Now, this is why this is a bit concerning, really. In the States, there's been something called the Great Resignation Event. Lots of people have basically packed in their jobs in the States. Now, this is from Monthly Labour Review. Check out the reference there. Not dabbling into economics here. That's outside my remit. But over the last year, rate of job quitting is the highest since record began in uh, 2020. So it's the highest that we know of people packing in their jobs. Um, why that would be is is currently unclear, but it could be that some people are not fit enough to carry on working. Uh, this is from uh, economic research. Uh, available jobs in the United States, 11.3 million. So clearly, um, there's a lot of job vacancies in the United States, and clearly this is going to be affecting the economy. So the question is, is this great resignation event uh, caused by a mass dis disabling event as a result of the complications of the pandemic. I think it's probably better to say complications of the pandemic rather than complications of COVID itself, because, of course, there's other things associated with the pandemic, such as, for example, um, uh, lockdowns that, that, that could have uh, facilitated some of this uh, apparent pathology in the community so um white collar workers have been affected resigned teachers um very high reporting rate of long covid in teachers and educators in the united states uh, higher than a lot of other groups uh, healthcare workers it's been affected restaurant and food workers we did look at food processing workers a few times uh, food processing workers work in difficult environments very often especially meat processing and um, very often close side by side in, in uh, relatively stuffy environments on a long line. So a uh, lot of spread of COVID there. But why that should feed through into more long COVID than the rest of the communities, um, not really clear. Not really clear at all. Comparison with the UK ONS data. So as of September the 1st, this, so this was reported by the ONS on September the 1st. So it's a bit out of date. And the data only actually goes up to the 21st of July. So it's comparable to, to the uh, CDC data. People experiencing self-reported long COVID, 2 million, 3.1% of the population, as opposed to 7.5. This is the big difference. And both self-reporting. So um, there's something going on here. We haven't quite got to the bottom of it. Of this 2 million, symptoms for at least 12 weeks, 83% of that 2 million. Symptoms for at least one year, 45% of that 2 million. Symptoms for two years, 22% of that grouping of uh, 2 million, 3.1% of the population. Most common features, fatigue, 62%, shortness of breath, 37%, difficulty concentrating, 33%, muscle ache, 31%. And we have looked at other symptoms uh, in the past as well, longer list of symptoms. Uh, symptoms adversely, adversely affected day-to-day -day activities in 73% of those reporting long COVID. As we've said, more common in 35 to 69-year-olds in the UK, more common in females, more common in people living in deprived areas, more, people in people, more common in people working in social care. 
and uh, other activity pe- more common in people with other activity limiting health conditions or disability less common in those that are looking for work although the ONS puts that as a double negative but I've decoded it into less common in those that are actively looking for work um, possible influence there in the reporting now big difference in the reporting in the United States and the United Kingdom way more people have packed in their jobs in the United States than in the United Kingdom uh, way more job vacancies in the United States so there's a definite difference between the two countries is this related to the way that COVID was managed in these countries that's certainly a possibility um, is it related to preventative measures that were taken to prevent COVID um, such as um, such as lockdowns uh, that that is that is quite that is quite possible but we really need to know more now what is going to happen here well the number of people with long covid in the united states will probably start to go down because as we know from the uk data um, it's more common uh, that the people that are reporting it more people report it for 12 weeks than report it for one year and report it for two years but the point is the longer this goes on these people that are reporting long COVID for um, at least a year and over two years, that the longer it goes on to me, the more it indicates the possibility that the long COVID symptoms are caused by actual tissue damage. So, for example, if there's damage to the central nervous system, that doesn't repair very readily, if at all. Damage to the heart, that doesn't repair very readily, if at all. And likewise, if the architecture of the lungs or the architecture of the kidneys is actually disturbed, uh, then that's not going to heal readily or indeed if it heals at all. Whereas if it's a physiological change, for example, uh, inflammation as a result of having to combat the infection, then that would you expect that to resolve? So are we going to be left with long term morbidities as the Uh, as the acute phase of the pandemic passes and we know that some people a minority of people get actually really quite ill with their long covid and and require hospitalization but for others it's limiting their their uh, ability to perform normally causing a lot of suffering in both our countries but particularly in the united states so i think there's more to come on this I'm not going to speculate further because that's kind of what we know at the moment. But unfortunately, it does look like we're going to have a burden of morbidity and with some mortality, at least for some time to come as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the effect of the virus of the pandemic and as a result of strategies taken to combat the pandemic. When there's more facts, we'll report them. That's the facts we have at the moment. Thank you for watching.